Well, good morning, Teachers on Fire. Thanks for joining us for another edition of the Teachers on Fire Roundtable. My name is Tim Cavey. I'm an eighth grade teacher, assistant principal, and the host of the Teachers on Fire podcast. I'm excited to be joined this morning by three educators who kind of represent a different kind of learning a different approach to school, if you will, and they are set on a mission of reimagining school and K-12 education. Uh, so welcome to the three of you. I'm going to turn it over to you and ask you to just briefly introduce yourselves, talk about your context in learning, and we'll take it from there. Rita. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Um, I guess I'll uh, present my resume. <laughs> I'm not uh, officially a teacher. Uh, my background is in early education. Uh, I am the founding partner at Galaria Elevated Learning. I'm also, I've spent, gosh, 11, 12 years working with Nadia at Academics Pre-Kindergarten, uh, where I'm the, well, it's my title, Chief Education Officer. <laughs> Uh, but basically, I work. What I do is uh, where we look at de uh, developing curriculum programming. I work with uh, Fraser Health and Coastal when it comes to licensing, so all the policies, policies and procedures. Um, I've spent some years at a college as a ECE field practicum instructor. I've worked at an independent school as well uh, as a coordinator for an after school clubs program, manager as a summer camp uh, manager. Uh, but I guess most importantly, I'm a parent of uh, two very outspoken girls. Uh, I think that's important because, uh, you know, I've I've done the uh, you know, I did search out to find this, the best school for my daughter. I did end up uh, for my older one. We went in, we ended up going with an independent school just because I needed the smaller class size for her. I knew who she was and she needed that. She always took a little bit longer to meet those developmental milestones. Uh, and then um, uh, we stayed there for a few years. Then we went on to go to a public school, late French immersion. Uh, we were out of catchment. Uh, we rented a place uh, that we didn't move into so that my daughter could start at this school. Uh, so I guess I, I think it's important to note that, yes, I, I have the I'm not officially a teacher. I am an educator of young, uh, young children, uh, but I'm also a parent who also struggles with finding a place that a school, uh, a teaching program that best meets my children's needs. All right. Well, it's great when you bring that experience, that perspective as not only a, well, and Marissa here in the audience says, you are an educator, Rita, uh, but you're also coming at this as a parent that brings that added firsthand experience as well. Nadia, over to you. Please introduce yourself. Good morning. Um, oh, gosh. So like Rita, um, I'm not a I wouldn't call myself an official teacher. Uh, I landed in the world of education um, as a parent, um, I'll say probably now 12, 13 years ago. And I, through happenstance and a, my own personal predicament, trying to find a place that I thought was would fit my family and my needs um, and what I'd like to see my children do. Um, in early education. So I ended up opening up my first early education center then, and that's when me and Rita crossed paths. Um, for me, when I think about education and educators, I think we're all educators. I think we're all learners. I think uh, children are, le are educators. So it's a really broad question. Um, how I how I landed in Gloria, it's a similar, I'd say a similar story where um, I was in early education for quite some time um, with multiple centers and I have experience in centers in the US as well. And uh, Gloria kind of landed as an opportunity and just as an idea. And I had the wonderful uh, honor and privilege to work with some amazing people to put together what I would say is the dream school I would want to go to. Yes, I'd love my, my one of my daughters actually does go to Gloria, um, but 
it, it, at, my, at the essence of what Gloria is, which is empowering and dominable spirit, that is for me the purpose of education in three words. So yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Empowering indomitable spirit. Love that. Yes. And we're going to dig a little deeper into the kind of school that the three of you are building here in a moment. But first of all, Peter, talk to us about who you are and where you're coming from. Morning. And uh, yeah, I'll emulate Rita and Nadia. Thanks for having us. And thanks everybody for tuning in, especially on the West Coast. It's a, it's a little bit early. Uh, I grew up in, in sport and I did everything as a child growing up. Um, but at the same time, I was also curiously, uh, you know, weirdly good at, at physics and math. So I had this this dichotomy happening. Uh, I swam for the national team, uh, got into skateboarding and snowboarding early in action sports. Uh, ended up out at uh, Carleton University at aerospace engineering for a couple of years before kind of getting a peek into the educational system and and not not trusting that I was going to graduate and be excited about what I was going to do for the rest of my life. So I took one year off, uh, stayed for 10, managed to, to eke out a living as a, as a pseudo professional snowboarder. And that kind of transitioned into um, athlete management and marketing and branding, video production, imagery, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and from there, action sports has a very community based uh, culture, right? If you're, if you're not, supporting one another if you're not progressing or evolving the individuals in the sport then you get booted out pretty quick whether you're a brand or even you know someone down at the skate park so uh kind of riding that wave i ended up at red bull where i was the marketing manager on the west coast or sorry the prairies alberta saskatchewan manitoba then i was the national communications manager for a couple of years for athlete and sport uh, then I was the sport director for two years here in Canada before Austria Global Headquarters kind of uh, cherry picked me out to Salzburg in Austria, where I lived for five years, worked with uh, Red Bull for two and a half, three of those years as the, the global head of athletes, overseeing 750 athletes and 170 odd disciplines throughout uh, 72, 73 countries. So I managed the athlete managers in each of those countries that oversaw all the athletes. So uh, in terms of, you know, teaching and and trying to build out a culture of of, of support of of evolving these 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 communities, um, that was that was really my my role on a global level for the Red Bull Athlete Program. Um, so once I left Austria, I came back here, worked with an organization that runs a bunch of uh, <clears throat> pardon me a bunch of uh, restaurants that I'm also a partner in. Uh, when COVID hit. Uh, obviously, the restaurant industry took a, a bit of a, a, you know, took a few steps back. So I stepped back from my role there. I had met uh, Nadia and and Rita probably about a year and a half before COVID really hit, and learned about their idea for Gloria, and it really fit into into my core purpose, right? When it comes to evolving and progressing and supporting communities. So they were floundering a little bit with some contemporary brand marketing and communications uh, agencies that just kept feeding them the exact same brand story that every other school in, you know, basically in the world has. So uh, I tried to to pick their brains as best I could and build out, build out the brand story uh, and the brand identity and that core purpose, right? Empower and dominable spirit uh, for all of us to live by. Uh, so yeah, I got a little ahead of myself, but anyway, when COVID hit and I left the restaurants, I joined Gloria pretty much full time uh, overseeing all, all brand marketing and communications. That is super helpful. Thank you for that, Peter. And I think, yeah, a lot of schools and district leaders sort of overlook the value of branding or they hear the word branding and they sort of shrink back and say, oh, no, that's not really what we're about. But every school needs to tell their story. And, and you alluded to that. And when we're not telling our story, other people are telling it for us. Uh, and, and so maybe that's something we'll get into. But you've all mentioned Gloria Elevated Learning. So let's dig into that. Peter, I'll go back to you. Tell us what is Gloria and how is your school different? You know, as you, as I'm, I'm sure you guys can all see on the website, right? The, we, we strive to be the educational catalyst that's driving change and empowering students to identify and, and pursue their unique purpose. Um, in a world where everything is becoming hyper-specialized, 
right? At three years old, you better know what musical instrument you're going to play. At three years old, you better know what sport you're going to play. You know, if you're going to be a doctor, what are you going to be focused on? So, um, you know, and, and over the past 10, 15 years, we've really come to understand that range really is the key for, uh, you know, overall learning and, and progression. So when it comes to Gloria, we're not a sports school. We're not an art school. We're not a tech school, right? Primarily we're an academic school, but we ensure that everybody, if you look at our, our, K, our, uh, our K to four program, it's not called, you know, a, a grade school or whatever. We call it experience and discover all sports, all arts, you know, in a tech immersive environment. So there's still coding, you're still learning languages, you're still learning all the, the, the STEM topics, but making sure that there's a wide range of experience so that people can, or the kids can really discover exactly what they love as they move into the, the five to eight section, which is define and develop. And then you, then you start to narrow it just a little bit to define exactly what they're excited about and what they wanna, what they wanna be doing and start to develop that. And then when you get to the to the senior level, we call it apply and I'll, <clears throat> pardon me, apply and elevate, where you take what you experienced and, and discovered, eventually defined and developed, and then now you can focus a little bit more and apply and elevate. So when you do graduate, you're ready for the world, understanding not only what you love, but also lots of other things. So what other people love, you know, you can you can wrap your head around. That's what I would if I was to put it up together that was a that was a pretty good summary nadia and rita over to you nadia tell us a little bit more about the history i mean how old is this school when was it founded okay so i'll tell you a little bit about the story of the school <laughs> so um probably over five years ago uh a, a friend of mine mentioned that he had this idea and this dream to have a school um, and he talked about um, his personal purpose of um, elevating uh, people boldly or elevating people and sorry, boldly elevating people. And he um, it, it was something he told me in passing. And I had known him because his children had been the first uh, children to have enrolled in my preschool program in my first center in 2010. So we had a so we had this chat and it was great and it sounded so interesting and I told him that you know if he needed anything to let me know but this sounded really inspiring and amazing. Well, he went off and um, maybe a year or two later he called me and said, "Well, I've done a little bit of investigating with my team and I realized that I don't operate schools. I don't do schools. Um, I know what I'm good at and I." Um, you know, I'd love to know if you'd want to be interested in, in being a part of this program. And at that time, I was in the midst of one of the most chaotic periods in my personal life. So I hung on to it. I jumped on that train. I um, needed something to help me kind of through the fog and the chaos. And Gloria was my anchor. Um, and, and we were really lucky to put together an amazing board of advisors, um, people in health tech, people in development, um, people, uh, you know, the leaders in medical field in British Columbia. Um, I was lucky enough to, um, to get Rita to, to join me in, uh, on board this project. That was kind of one of my terms when I joined, as I told him that only if Rita or I gets to be a part of this. And I pulled Peter in um, along the way, and um, it is. And so through that process, we did. You know, our story really is um, about not only it, it was for me. It was a it was a process of empowering my indomitable spirit, which sounds kind of interesting now that I look back at it. It, it was that kind of process, but in that we delved into, in that process, we delved into what would be the program, what would be the right way to present um, and 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 build that confidence um, and that spirit in every child. And so through that, we decided art, sports and academics, kind of in an even killed fashion. We felt they were all important, just like mind, body, spirit is all important. Um, and the other thing that we found um, really concerning to us was, um, we see it in adults, but we see it in children as well a lot, is um, the fear of failure. 
the fear of trying something new, the fear of being uncomfortable. Um, parents are sometimes uncomfortable allowing their children to fail, allowing their children to to um, be disappointed or have to go through some you know emotionally difficult things. But um, growth comes through uncomfort. Growth does not come through comfortable things. So uh, we pick challenge-based learning based on that. And challenge-based learning um, at its core, to me anyways, is it's a problem-solving based program. Uh, life is a set of challenges. That's every day is, you know, a few challenges. Getting up in the morning can be a challenge. Um, and it's about how you face it. It's about having um, the skill set um, and um, the confidence to face those things without the fear of failure. And I, I feel as though um, in this fast paced world and in a world that's becoming more and more competitive, um, people get really stuck on grades and people get really stuck on numbers and under, you know, understanding you know, ensuring that you get 99 on a test and ensuring you know this math problem or math, you know, equation perfectly instead of the skill set you need to survive and to thrive and to um, get through the rest of life. It's it's totally amazing to understand how to, you know, do an equation perfectly correct. But I think the um, most important um, part about, you know, building uh, indomitable spirit or allowing someone empowering that spirit is to um, take away that fear, right? The fear of, it's, it's almost like fear of living, fear of, of, of trying something new and, and yeah. And that for me is what education should be about. You are talking my language there, Nadia, when you talk about uh, ignoring or not ignoring, but moving, helping learners move through the fear of failure. And I, my, I was sort of, I had some questions brewing about assessment because that's always the next question, right? Is how do you handle assessment? How do you uh, present it in a way that uh, students are not overly concerned about that label that they fit into and they're willing to take a few more risks along the way, along their learning journey. Uh, thank you, Erica, for joining us. Uh, Erica is saying she dropped the mic last night at the Q conference and her theme was mind, body, spirit. This is what all schools should be like. Thank you, Erica. And Rita, over to you. Now, Nadia started to take us into challenge-based learning. Is there anything, maybe we should transition there. So. Let's dig a little deeper into this whole area of challenge-based learning. Tell us more about what it is and why do you think this emphasis on challenge is important in education? I guess, how do I add to what Nadia said? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it's uh, solving real world challenges. I think that's the key. Um, nice. It makes it relevant for students. Otherwise, it's something that happened way back then. I think making it relevant, with their learning, their learning material is important. Uh, I think uh, the uh, you know with our inspection with the ministry um, Ministry of Education out here in BC, uh, one of the things they did talk about is how there's you know there's different types of learning project but different frameworks. What uh, challenge based uh, learning does is is that it takes it one step further when it comes to the action phase. So it's not just learning and questioning; it's taking action. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, uh, I think that as soon as you say, as an educator, I've I've been there where I've had a group of students, and I'll turn around and I'll I'll tell them, you know, there is a challenge. I have a challenge for you. I don't know. This is really hard. I don't know if you can get this. So as as soon as you say that, you've got them. And I think that um, even the even the most quietest student way in the back will focus, will listen, will 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 try. I think that's the biggest. I think when we talk about mistakes, mistakes can only happen if you try. So uh, I think uh, this is with challenge-based learning, you are responsible for your own learning. Uh, it, no challenge is wrong. Uh, it, it's uh, you engage, you investigate, you act. I think that's that's what I can say about um, uh, CBL. That's okay, CBL. I oh, see. I'm learn. I'm learning here. Nadia, go ahead thing actually as we was talking the thing somebody asked me recently about assessments too and you know and talking about the conversation um relayed to how people also kind of tie their own personal worth to their productivity or the things that they do and how that's so damaging especially to children um that you know you're worthy regardless of what you did today uh, 
But similarly in our assessments and the way that CBL is, is um, implemented in our program, the, the failures are celebrated. You tried, you fell, you got back up. That was, that's where we scream and shout and make a big deal. It's great that you, you know, I know that there's programs where the 90% is really, is, is where you get the stickers and the stamps, but in our, our effort at our school is to build that, um, that confidence and that want and that drive to try and to do things that are out of your comfort zone and to, and, and to know you're going to fall and know everyone's going to cheer you on creates a very different vibe, a very different um, educational environment, because that's what we're after. That's how um, our day to day even um, feedback is, is kind of, um, circles around if that helps in terms of assessment. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, I was in a, well, thinking back to my master's program at Vancouver Island University, um, we talked a lot about a growth mindset again, and this idea that you you three are talking about uh, this idea that growth doesn't happen in the comfort zone, that we want to constantly push beyond that. And I, I remember one instructor talking about a school where every time there was a failure in the classroom, everyone would just stop and clap and, and sort of applaud, which sounds really kind of weird, but it's this idea of just building this culture that actually embraces failure as evidence of risk taking, right? Of evidence of trying something that is new, of pushing that learning forward. I always take my students to, uh, you know, metaphorically to the gym and say, you know, if you want to build your muscles, you can't just keep doing what is comfortable. You've got to push yourself to a point that I know uh, bodybuilders call muscle failure, right? You've got to get to that point where your body cannot do anything more. And that's how you actually build muscle. And the same thing applies to our brains. Well, Peter, your school obviously puts a good deal of emphasis on STEAM learning or tech immersion. Talk about, and STEAM, by the way, for I, I sort of assume usually that most of us know what we're talking about there with STEAM, but uh, STEAM represents science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So a bit of arts integration there, or not a bit, but a significant arts integration. Talk about the current and future roles of technology in K-12 education, maybe at Gloria and elsewhere. Where do you see technology going? And do you feel like there's ever such thing as too much technology in the learning environment? <laughs> Before I get to that, I'm just going to go back and kind of uh, reflect sure. on some of the vernacular yeah. that was thrown around there. It, it's not failing, it's learning right? Kids, kids don't right. fail in the classroom, they learn in the classroom and, and there's and there's steps to get there. They may stumble, but you, we don't, failure is, uh, is definitive, right? You failed, it's over, you can't try again. So that's, it's, it's a real shift in, in, in your thinking to go from, from failing to, to learning. So pardon me. Uh, where is tech going? You know, uh, in the grand scheme of things, you look at Moore's law and you know the, the doubling of technology, right? The shrinking of transistors. It's, we're down to what once every 13 months or every 14 months. So technology is going nowhere but up or you know forward, extremely extremely fast. So uh, tech tech in schools, it, it it needs to be there from day one. You need to be immersed in it because when you when you leave school, you're you're going to be immersed in it and it's not only understanding tech and being able to utilize it and use it, you know, effectively and efficiently, but it's also understanding it, right? Tech really is just the transfer of information and being responsible with that information, understanding, being, being cognizant of where that information is coming from, what's the source, if you are gonna share it, are you being responsible with that share? Because there's a lot of people that trust you and look up to you. So when it comes to tech, right, there's 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 the there's the science of it, and then there's the the philosophy of it, and uh, we you you need to embrace both of those together as we move forward with tech to be you know primarily responsible with it. I feel, but it's it's inevitable, and it and it needs to be uh, implemented at all levels of education. I feel. Yeah, it's, it's certainly not a debate, right, whether or not technology is here or whether it plays a significant part in our world. It's here to stay. And the question is, are we preparing, are we equipping our learners to utilize it, to leverage it properly? You touched on something there, Peter, too, about 
uh, I can't remember your exact wording, but this uh, you sort of touched on or hinted on uh, digital citizenship and digital leadership, right? And I like that distinction. I was reading about that recently that, you know, we can, uh, we can help our students be safe online, but that's not really enough, right? We want them to help, uh, we, we wanna set them up to actually define their digital identity, their online presence. And I know that's just a small part of, of technology. Nadia, what else would you add to this discussion? Oh yeah, go ahead, Peter. I was gonna throw in one last thing, uh, just because you, you kind of triggered it. Um, what we really try to do at Gloria is instead of you know making sure that we, we teach our students how to think before we teach them what to think, as opposed to you know kind of contemporary education or traditional education where it's it's just what to think. Think this. This is this is how you problem solve. Think this. This is how you make decisions. It really is start at how to think, and then move on to what to think. Pardon me. Awesome, awesome. That's a mic drop moment right there, Nadia. What what is your what would you add to this whole discussion about technology? I mean, for some teachers, it feels overwhelming today. Uh, how do you see its role in the classroom, and uh, where do you see it going from here? Uh, I see it as a tool. So like there's a pencil and there's paper and now we have other tools. We have uh, tech tools or digital tools. Um, I think it's, uh, I understand it's a slippery slope. I understand um, the amount of time children spend in front of screens. Everyone, humans spend in front of the screens. Um, it's a concern. Uh, I don't think there's enough research right now to, to kind of, help us understand what that's gonna mean for us in the future. But um, I like to look at it as it's a tool. I like to, um, and that's how we frame it in our school. We, we They do do coding, they do do other activities with the tech tools to show them um, kind of, it's somewhat of its capacity. We bring in facilitators that are industry experts that use technology. Um, to help them see what um, that it's not just an iPad and it's not just a game that I get to click on. Um, and I think uh, when we talk about technology, it makes me think also about just the way that we've um, we create the learner educator model in Gloria. We we have our our day to day teachers, but we do bring in industry experts, and that's a really important part of our program. So so and that creates an environment and more of a community where our students see that all of us are teachers and all of us are learners. And it also um, makes their learning um, relevant, right? Otherwise it doesn't always make sense. Why am I even learning this? Why are we even doing this? But when you see how it's practically applied in, in day to day, it makes more sense. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's that's where we wanna yeah. go with the tech talk. But I just wanna add on also that uh, they don't spend our students don't spend all day on a tablet or a device uh, that that Galaria right. is a school where they're doing sports and arts as well with the academics. So the day is really nicely broken up. Yes, they're they're using a tablet or on screen for a bit doing re whatever they need to do, but then they're off to do hockey then they're back again um paper and pen time maybe and then they're off on the soccer field so the day it, it, there's a break there's always something happening i think that's important there's it, there's experiences that's what we call them that they, throughout the day they'll have different types of experiences it's a well-balanced day for our students that's awesome. Well, and I know the arts, as we uh, alluded to earlier, uh, plays a, a really significant role in, in the learning picture there. Let's move on to question five. And this is a shift in gears, but we, we do have two women here on the panel. I think that's really important. Last week, we observed International Women's Day. And of course, in the last week, we saw some tragic news uh, from the States uh, that made us think more about women and their role in society. So when you think about education, why is it so important for schools and districts to put women and, and women, minority women in places of institutional leadership? And I have to say last week on the show, we had five Latina superintendents from California, which was awesome. And uh, so they, you know, we know the picture is changing, but there are still some structural institutional 
changes that we need to see. Uh, I don't know who would be best suited to take on this one. Rita, why don't we go back to you? First of all, why do you think uh, the, like I say, the representation of minority women in places of leadership is so important? Gosh, uh, I think the best way to answer that is to share a story with you. Uh, I had uh, a mom call in for a tour. We did a virtual tour of Gloria. And after we did the tour, what was important to her was that uh, her child see, her daughter sees women of color in these positions as role models. And, you know, when you sum it all up, uh, I have uh, two girls as well. And uh, I, I do want to be there for them. And just like there were women there for me that helped me along the way, uh, it's our responsibility to do that for the next generation. Nadia, what would you add to that? Um, similar to what Rita said, I think everyone deserves to belong. Everyone deserves to be uh, a leader and to um, do, you know, I. I I, it's a sensitive topic for me a little bit, but um, I read a story a couple of days ago, uh, a, a black female author um, wrote how she bumped into a seven year old black girl. Um, and this little girl asked her what she did. Some They had a little conversation somewhere and the little girl, she, she told the little girl that she's an author and the little girl's mouth dropped. And she's like, what? you are an author and she's like yeah i'm an author and then she said the girl's like i didn't know that you know black women could be authors and she said of course they can and then she showed her a list of lots of other black female authors and reading that real like that for me was you know somebody says why shouldn't different people every different you know intersectionally people with different abilities you know, people of different ages, people of different color and faiths and culture, why they shouldn't be represented. Um, that is why, right there. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, it, it sort of takes me back again, thinking about my last panel last week, uh, one of these superintendents was making her way through a school and one of the students said, you mean you're the boss of the bosses? Like it's just sort of eye-opening to that particular girl. And I think that's so important. Peter, I don't want to leave you out of this conversation. What would you add in terms of, and maybe, you know, fit, connect this idea with the, just the story, the identity picture of your school and, and other schools like yours? Well, I came on a little bit later, but Nadia and Rita started Gloria because they wanted to implement systemic change in, in education. And to implement systemic change, you need to be in a, you need the right people in, in positions to be able to implement and execute that and then and then be able to perpetuate that once they leave so by you know ensuring that we have women in 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 positions where they can you know instigate imp implement and execute s systemic change is is mandatory to get those different perspectives and to ensure that at the base root level of education uh you know we're driving that of course, the, the mentorship aspect and, and the aspirational aspect for women, uh, female students, uh, but also to, to yeah, have that, 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 that female perspective, that understanding of what they've gone through and what they don't want uh, female students to be going through in the future, how to, how to instigate that change. And again, instigate, execute, perpetuate a systemic change in education to make sure that, that women are continuously bubbling up to where they belong. Yeah, well said. Uh, I want to move on to question six, and we're sort of circling around to learning and pedagogy a little bit, but you are, uh, for all intents and purposes, a very progressive school. Uh, you are, as we said off the top, you're reimagining learning. So let's talk about how are children learning differently today than they were 10 to 20 years ago? I know this question sort of invites the technology conversation again, uh, and that's a part of it, but are there other ways, do you think, in which uh, students and learners are learning differently? How can our teachers and schools teach responsibly to those needs? Um, Nadia, I'll go back to you on this one. Oh, and let me just make sure you've got the mic. There we go. So Sorry about that. <laughs> on the tech side, because I know that's a separate conversation. For me, when I think about what's changed like 20 years ago to today, honestly, I think it's parenting styles. I think um, 
I think the hovering, the helicoptering, um, the lawnmowering, all the new terms, I see it a lot. We see it in our early education centers. Um, and I've seen it as a parent through elementary school into high school, into university. My eldest is university. University kids have similar, it's interesting to watch how parents bubble wrap children. And I think it's, um, I yeah, I think that that, uh, I feel like children, I feel like children learn differently because they're limited by that now. I think that's a limiting factor. And I think that's part of why Gloria was a project we undertook is it's a place where we're trying to peel that bubble bubble wrap because uh, living requires um, feeling and going through and walking through lots of different fires. <laughs> um, and that's, that's what makes us human. That's what builds um, emotional regulation. That's what builds character and personality. And I think it's a shame when I I, I know why parents do it. I think that the intention is good. Um, I think they think that that's the route to the best life for our child, but um, it ends in a in an unfortunate way a lot of times. I so agree. I want to come back to that. David on Twitter says attention span. That's how he would answer that question. Educators must work harder to keep the interest of students. And of course, he touches on technology there. And someone on Twitch, Public Citizen, asks, what is the meaning of the name Gloria? Actually, we haven't covered that yet, so we should get to that. Uh, so maybe we'll take a detour. Can we take a detour? And may Rita, I don't know if you can answer that one for us. What is the meaning of the name Gloria? Gloria means grit. And uh, it, I think that, again, what Nadia was talking about, um, as parents, I think we provide our students with what we talked about, how we came to grit was uh, that we provide our students, our, our own children, with lots of experiences. Uh, we don't want them to miss out. We put them in this sport or that sport, that art, or this is what the latest program is. Your friends are doing it with their kids. Uh, your neighbors are taking their kids. So that's how parents learn, and therefore they want their child to participate. But what happens is it comes to a point where it gets a little bit harder. Uh, you, you enjoy the students go in, the child goes in, enjoys the activity, and then it gets a little bit harder. And it's so easy to quit. It's so easy to quit and move on. And the child turns around and says, mom, dad, I'm have, you know, yeah, it's not, it's not there for me. It's time for me to move on. And that's what we're doing. We're constantly moving our kids on to the next activity, next activity. But instead we're saying, let's slow down a little, uh, figure out um, with Gloria, you have these experiences, you're in these sports programs and you're in these arts programs. Eventually you'll figure out who you are and from that time, then you pursue that. Um, and in order to, and you want to do that for not uh, for, for life. If you enjoy your activity, if you enjoy your sport, you want to play that for life as an adult. It uh, doesn't mean it has to be competitive. It just needs to be something you enjoy. There's a purpose behind it. So I think that's what Galore is. Is when if you if you enjoy something, if you find your passion, it's never going to be easy. It's going to be hard work and you have to love it enough to pursue it. I think that's what, uh, what Gloria is. I am so resonating with what you are saying there. I am an eighth grade teacher, like I said, part-time, part-time admin. And one of my projects that I'm trying to get going this year is some student podcasting. And I think one of the great benefits of uh, podcasting is that students can potentially continue with this activity right outside of school and make that real life connection. And so uh, we're very good or I feel like we're getting better as educators at, at uh, getting our students to create things of meaning and connection with their world. But even thinking beyond the school environment, that really gets me excited. Uh, I'm th still thinking about Nadia's point about <laughs> parents bubble wrapping children. And to be fair to the parents out there, I mean, I'm a parent too. I, I wrestle with this on some levels. Um, we need, we know our, our children need to have problems, right? We need to let them have some problems or what we call the productive struggle. We know that is good for them. Peter, uh, I want to keep going with that question. How else do you see learning changing or you know, when you when you compare learning today to the learning you and I experienced a long time ago, uh, how do you feel like schools can respond a little differently to those needs today? 
I'm going to quickly refer to an old adage that I that I throw around quite often is if if you were to take someone from 1870 and put them in a time machine and bring them to today and they looked around the only two things that they would recognize would be schools and churches and you know it's not just 10 or 20 years ago it, we're talking about 100 years of of the same educational practices so it's it's it makes it that much more it's so entrenched it makes it that more difficult to you know to cause that systemic change or, or be that catalyst to you know we come in uh, with our ideas of how to run a school. And of course, the, the establishment is uh, frowning quite often at us. You know, we're not, we're not checking the right boxes or, or fitting into the right framework or, or however it, it works. Um, but it, it really is just asking, asking new questions, finding new solutions for how do we educate our children for, for, to be prepared for tomorrow's world. So, yeah. In a nutshell, um, that's where I stand. <laughs> and, and we can be thankful as British Columbia educators, right, that our new curriculum gives us so much room to actually move around and to interpret what that educational experience, to use a term that you used earlier in the conversation, to interpret what that will look like for students. And, and it does give us a lot of freedom. We don't have those same long lists of itemized content that we need to cover. We have we have our parameters, but then we have a lot of uh, room for interpretation, a, a lot of flexibility within that. Well, you are building something special at Gloria Elevated Learning. This has been a pleasure to have you on with us today. Uh, before we close, I want to ask the question, how can we connect with you and join your learning journeys? As I prep for this conversation. I, I didn't get the sense that you're heavily into social media or the Twitter world, let's say, but uh, tell us how we can connect. And uh, Peter, as I open with you, maybe on this round, of course, uh, let anyone interested in Gloria, if you're in the lower mainland, uh, let them know how they can get in touch with your school as well. Yeah, personally, the three of us aren't aren't heavy into social media, but but the school, of course, has its channels so that we can we can share what's happening within the school and 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 what we're all about. Uh, so at uh, I would say Instagram is probably your best bet. Everything that we're that we're posting there is trickling down to Facebook. So for for conversations, you know, you can you can track it down on on Facebook and. Uh, yeah, but for the day to day, what's happening, you know, week on week, that kind of thing. Uh, Instagram uh, at Gloria School is uh, is probably the best place to, to check us out. All right. I will make sure I know I'm following you on Twitter or following the school on Twitter. I'll make sure to take a look around Instagram. Nadia, how can we connect with you? Uh <laughs> Probably the best way to connect with me is through the Gloria channel. Um, I'm not heavily entrenched in any social media, but um, <laughs> as you probably figured out by now. Uh, so yeah, at Gloria School, I'll get the message. You could, That's the best way to reach me. All right, sounds good. And oh, Rita? Pardon, Sorry. pardon. Uh, I'm Sorry, the, the YouTube channel, we've got some, some, some great moving image content that we've put together. Uh, to you know really try to tell our story in, in a succinct way that's right yeah thank you for mentioning that the youtube channel here from gloria is mind-blowing i was very very impressed and it really does tell the story of your school and what you're all about really well so if you are interested make sure to head over there on youtube and rita sorry you were uh, you were just saying I was, I was saying that i'm even probably harder to find than these two uh, on social media um, through Go Gloria School. That's the best way. All right. Well, again, thank you so much to the three of you. And I'll say for anyone joining us live today, thank you so much for watching, listening, contributing with your comments. I am here every Saturday morning, 8 a.m. Pacific. As Peter said, that's a little early here on the West Coast at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern in great conversations with educators. We are interested in uh, sharing best practices, in sparking uh, curiosity, in igniting your practice. So thank you so much. And we've got one last comment that will fit in from Erica. Can't wait to check it out. I'm online looking for similar schools in the U.S. Well, that is great. Erica, you've been with us from start to finish. Thank you so much. And for everyone else joining us live or on the replay, thank you as well. 
I'm going to say take care, goodbye, enjoy the rest of your Saturdays, and great to be connected with you. Peter, go ahead, last word. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to ruin your, your outro there, but Erica, no, no. If, you do, if you do find a similar school in the US, please forward it to us. We'd love to check them out and, and get into uh, communication with them and, and, and share knowledge and, and learnings. Pardon me, Tim, sorry. It's yeah, no worries. It sounds like an amazing, really an amazing educational experience. Love what the three of you are building. So keep up the great work and uh, we'll talk again soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.